Good evening, and welcome to the Hollywood Babylonians. <laughs> Hello, 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 friends! Welcome to the second ever episode of the Hollywood Babylonians, where we discuss the history and themes behind some of your favorite classic films. And today, for our very special second episode, I have the wonderful, the beautiful Miss Jamie Lee. Hello, Jamie. Hello, Benjamin. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I am. I'm okay. Um, you are. I could be better. I went to the dentist today and um, still recovering from that. Anyway, I'm. I'm doing much better now. I'd rather talk about classic films than go to the dentist any day. So, Jamie, let's start off the very second episode of The Hollywood Babylonians talking about what we are here for, which is classic film. And I'd love for you to tell our listeners why you like classic film. What is your history with it? Is it a healthy history? Is it a toxic history? <laughs> it's. I would say it's a healthy history. Um, you know, I think it just started by my parents' love films. And so they would especially my mom would just have like TCM on, you know, on our TV mm -hmm. as she was working or doing whatever. And so I still remember it was channel 64 back at home was <laughs> TCM. But, you know, I think it just part of it was like, it was something that we did together, you know, mm -hmm. um, and just her being able to share movies that she had already seen with me that was part of it but it's it's also like i i devour so many films and shows and movies that it's like this untapped source for me you know it's mm -hmm. like i oh there's still more you know even if i've seen all the movies of today there's still more treasures back there that you know some people right. just don't know about and then there's the fact that you get to like share it with other people when you discover it because mm -hmm. I love myself a hidden treasure, so. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yes, and that's part of the that's part of the part, point of this po podcast is there's an unlimited number of classic yes. films. I mean, at one time during the 30s, 40s, and part of the 50s, uh, major Hollywood studios were putting out 52 films each year. You know, so they were literally yeah. literal factories. Crazy. So yes. So anyway, thank God for the studios that are restoring those and put the, putting those out so we can still watch them and talk yes, about thank them. thank you. Yes, thank you. I think it is time for us to jump into our second classic film that we're talking about on this podcast. Are you ready, Jamie? I am so ready. Let's dive right in like Katherine Hepburn did in The Philadelphia Story. Oh my goodness. It's time for George Cukor's 1940 MGM classic, The Philadelphia Story. And Jamie, who does it star? Oh my goodness. Well, Ben, that is such a loaded question. We've got Catherine Hepburn, the queen, the goddess herself. We've got Jimmy Stewart. We've got Cary Grant. We've got, oh, help me out here. Who else do we have? We have, oh, Ruth Hussey. We can't yes, forget about Ruth her Hussey. playing Liz Embry. We have Roland Young as Uncle Willie. Little sister um, Dinah is yeah, Virginia Weidler, I think yes. is how you pronounce her last name. I believe so. So, Jamie, what do you love about the Philadelphia story? Well, there's so much to love, Benjamin yes. Burke. Um, I would say one of the top um, appeals to me is a drunk Jimmy Stewart any mm -hmm. day that is a treat. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, knowing more about like Catherine Hepburn's history, mm -hmm. um, has made me appreciate her so much more. I wasn't mm -hmm. ever like the biggest fan of her. She wasn't my go-to gal, you know, right. thinking about the movie stars that I love, but, um, just like kind of respecting and recognizing how she got to be, you know, where she ended up, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. makes me appreciate her so much more but 
So, you know, learning about her history is the cool part for me. And then seeing her at play with these other actors that, I mean, just to me, it's like, what a great cast of characters, you know? Mm. And such oh, a fun sure. story too, you know, there's a lot of fun and, and themes that everybody deals with, you know, with um, just wanting to be loved. We all just really want to be loved, right? Right. Right. It's about humanizing the one dimensional goddess and kind of humanizing a way of life at that time that was, you know, it was kind of vague for a lot of people. They weren't yes. exactly sure what it was like and what they did know about it was all through like tabloids. And it's a perfect reflection of her life and kind of, you know, uh, it revitalized her career through a reflection of her own self. Yes, but can you remember the first time you saw Philadelphia Story? Oh my gosh. I feel like it was probably in high school. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking how elegant everybody looked, you know? And and I, like I said, I hadn't been a huge fan of hers. But when I saw right. her in this film, I will just say that it, the costume designer was Adrian, right? Mm hmm got the job done because i remember thinking like oh she's amazing i oh, mean sure. and just like i know it sounds superficial but <laughs> high school jamie was like she looks incredible she does look like a goddess you know and right. just the, the costuming was so impressive mm -hmm. um i think that really stuck out to me at the time it was like oh this film is so pretty too, you know, even oh, though yeah. it also has all these other great things going on about it. Well, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about her is that she took this product that she owned, which was Philadelphia Story, and she went to the Rolls Royce of all movie studios at the time. Uh, she sold it to MG MGM, Louis B. Mayer, who was well, it shows that she knew her worth as an actress. She kn It shows that she knew the worth of the product that she was selling. And yeah. um, if you want to real fast, I have a bunch of notes about Adrian. Oh, we can talk yes, about please. Those. Yes. Okay. So uh, Adrian, well, like I said, MGM at the time was the Rolls Royce of all movie studios. And in our last episode, we talked a little bit about how the movie studios of the time worked, where it was like a massive umbrella and the entire studio or the studio head Plus their fixer, um, who was most of the time in cahoots with the mafia and the L.A. police and all of that stuff. So um, they own the actors, they own the costume designers, they own the cinematographers, they own the directors. All of them were under contract and all of them were being really controlled uh, by the press machine, you know, what they did, what they couldn't do, who are they, who they dated, who they were marrying, you know, how they wanted to cover up some nasty parts of their public life. So Adrian was, of course, like everybody else, under contract to one of these movie studios, which was MGM. So he was actually from Connecticut, and he was born in 1903. He began as Adrian Adolph Greenberg. And he began using the dramatic Adrian in 1921. And then he eventually added the first name Gilbert. So it became Gilbert at Adrian, which was, I believe, his father's first name. So he signed with MGM in 1929. And he worked there until 1941 when he, like, branched off and he started designing his, like, he created his own line of clothes. Oh. Uh, primarily for women. And he also became a painter. He was very artistic. And he um, unfortunately died in 1959. But he was married until 1956 to Janet Gaynor. Well, and I will watch this fantastic commentary on the DVD credits. Well, the Criterion Blu-ray credits from um, film historian Janine Bassinger, and she called him one of the most influential costume designers of the time. His costumes were, according to Janine Bassinger, designed especially for the camera, one of the first to realize that that was a necessity. So he designed each of the costumes to be a part of the world, to be a part of the persona of the actress or the actor he was trying to design for. So he was famous for, you know, designing for people like Harlow, Garbo, Crawford. He designed for Catherine Hepburn. 
And like I said, he designed for the star persona, and he's famous for creating clothes for who the public thought that each star was. Not always about the character, but it was about who the public thought that that star was, you know, their personal life. It's like that's the costume he was designing for the character in the movie. So he was he was developing even the more the celebrity persona in the film rather than just the character. That's and he so designed clothes for... Norma Sherer, well, like I said, he designed clothes for Norma Sherer that women were supposed to wear off screen if they were wealthy. And he designed for Garbo. His designs were um, geometric and, and exotic for Garbo. And Harlow was bold and brassy and clothes that showed off her figure. Now for Crawford, the wonderful thing he did for Joan Crawford, who for her, he was always like the number one costume designer. She loved Adrian. Oh. Yes, but she finally left MGM in 1943. Well, really, two years after he had left. And she went over to Warner Brothers, which was a whole different gaggle of costume designers, such as um, Bernard Newman and Ori Kelly. And The wonderful thing that he did for Crawford was that he was able to combine like the geometric exoticism of Garbo with kind of the, the bold and brassy... Um, the bold and brassy of Harlow. So he's able to put those two together for Crawford. And he really, he was the first one to design the massive shoulder pad, pads that we all know for Joan Crawford's. And it allowed her to epitomize an aggressive modern woman, which is what she played in so many of her films. Not wow. always. That... Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, I know. And he also, so many people also uh, forget that he designed <laughs> Uh, well, he designed all of the amazing um, gowns for Marie Antoinette. Have you seen that with Norma Cher? No. It's MGM in 1938. It's gorgeous. And it's one of those around 38, 39, 40 that was supposed to be shot in Technicolor. And one of the reasons yeah. they didn't shoot it in Technicolor was because, of course, the movie went way over budget because they had to, like, build all of the sets of the French, you know, the French court and all of the costumes. But also, at that time in 1938, David O. Selznick had started to shoot Gone with the Wind. And uh -huh. so they, you know, he had... Well, and at that time, Technicolor was, like, had its own plant and it had so many cameras only so many cameras and I think it only had 24 cameras and he was using all 24 to shoot you know like the burning of Atlanta one of the things that people always forget is that he also designed like fantasy he designed the costumes for Wizard of Oz which I think he is probably he's best known for did what? you not know that no I didn't know that and one of the um well, one of the things I mean Jamie and I went to undergrad together for everyone listening and so we Boiler had, alert. what I said spoiler alert. Oh, spoiler alert. I know we're going to get we're going to get to that unhealthy part of our lives later in this episode. Oh no. <laughs> not really. It was a, it was a great it was a great time. We like our costume what it what was she our costume instructor? She was she would she told us about um Adrian designing the costumes for Wizard of Oz and for the Munchkin costumes he used I think he used felt which is one of the worst things to have to cut and try to, you know, sew together and surge and all of that stuff. So um, I felt sorry for all of the people that worked on the costumes for Wizard of Oz. It was like, oh, Adrian wants to use felt <laughs> to make all of these ridiculous geometric designs and try to weave all of this stuff together in the, you know, the Munchkins costumes. Anyway, now... We're going to go past Wizard of Oz. Janine, I think her name is Janine Bassinger, that did this commentary on the Philadelphia Story Blu-ray. She said, Catherine Hepburn's clothes are casually elegant with simple flowing lines. And it looks very rich, but her clothes are understated and not flowy. Well, as so many of the rich people were then, they were very rich and their clothes looked incredible which we'll talk about later, the real um, Tracy Lord that Catherine Hepburn's character was based on. But they tried very hard to understate their clothes so they didn't look as rich as they actually were. What are some other things that you love about Philadelphia Story or that you want to talk about Philadelphia Story? Who is your favorite character? Let's go with that question. Okay, well, I believe after rewatching it. I mean, like I said, I love me some Ju Jimmy Stewart, but mm -hmm. I think Liz is my favorite character upon watching it again, especially mm -hmm. as like a grown-up now. Yes. Yes. Oh, for sure. 
just so cool, so classy, sure of herself. I mean, if she's worried, you can't tell.